Well, thank you very much for uh, tuning in this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I think in many cases, um, thank you for coming back. Uh, a very brief introduction. Um, a lot of what we're going to be, the test case for tonight, the case study, uh, is a battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment and a territorial battalion at that. So I have to start off with, uh, with some confessions uh, in that uh, I'm an ex-territorial officer uh, and my family comes from West Yorkshire and this was very much the, uh, the family battalion. So I have a set of biases about the quality of Yorkshire territorials that you, you have to aim off for while we're talking. Further, um, those of you who saw the previous talk, that was about the big battle skills uh, and the development of their tactical abilities in a series of big engagements. This is about a much smaller form of war, the, the patrol war. And actually, uh, during my time in the TA, uh, this was uh, some of the work that, uh, that I was training to do, spending my time crawling around Salisbury Plain in the dark. So that's one of the reasons it's such a, an area of, of special interest. What we're going to do tonight is a very quick introduction uh, to the battalion. Then we're going to look at patrolling and raiding uh, as a general topic in the Great War, and then look at three sets of incidents around Beaumont Hamel uh, after the Battle of Bullecourt uh, and up at Oppie uh, and Biers Wood, and then see if we can draw some conclusions uh, together about what all of, of this means. So, very quickly, uh, at C Company, the 2nd, 5th. The 62nd Division is a second line territorial division. So the first line territorials go off to war uh, very quickly in 1915, and a second line uh, set of territorials are raised originally for a home defense role and then to supply recruits uh, to the 1st, 5th Battalion, this being the 2nd, 5th. Uh, but as casualties mount, the decision is taken to move the second line territorial units out to France. So, which means that although it's raised in 1914, the uh, second fifth doesn't actually see France until January of 1917. Now, why that's important for our purposes is that these units are trained, their, their embarkation training uh, takes place on Salisbury Plain in 1916, and it then really isn't topped up. So when these guys arrive uh, in France, they are, have got pre-SOM standard training. So everything they do in 17 and 18 is part of this learning process of how they become an effective fighting force. And that, that's really why they make such a good text case, because they are new to it, their officers are new to it. Um, really, you've got to get up to brigade commander before you're finding really experienced soldiers. So that's, and this is C Company of the 2nd, 5th, uh, who you will be meeting again later. So let's move more generally, uh, patrolling and raiding. There are two very different schools of thought uh, about what all of this was for. And the maintenance of morale and fighting spirit, which gives the talk its uh, um, title, uh, is straight out of field service regulations. Uh, with comments like, the offensive is the soul of defense. They were very worried about the lethargy of trench warfare affecting the men, the idea of stickiness that they won't get out of the trenches. But there were also three fairly standard uh, approaches, uh, sorry, um, reasons for doing it, about gathering information, about making life difficult for the enemy, uh, and about training and familiarization of, of troops with combat on a small scale. There is, however, a very different school um, and a lot of this turns up in letters, it turns up in documents that are uh, written much later. The patrolling was, as Sassoon says, an invitation to suicide. You've got your best soldiers going out. And then in some way, it's actually about whose brigade or whose division is more aggressive. And it does stir the enemy up. Uh, and this concept of live and let live, that if you don't bother him, he won't bother you. If you're going to be fighting an active patrol war, you're going to bother him. You may well have to pay a price for that. And it's very hard to get to the, the truth of this. So I want to ask some questions this evening about, well, how much of this really goes on? Why were they bothering? What sort of people did them? What did they achieve? And particularly, what was the attitude at the time, rather than what people started to think about them five, 10, and 15 years after the war? So we'll have a little look at these, these questions as, as we go through. Now, for units at the time, there isn't much to help 
it's really quite late in the war before you get anything uh, that could be described as a doctrine. Um, in infantry training 1914, there's very little because actually real patrolling is the work of the cavalry. Minor operations, uh, which comes out in March 1916, gives patrol work the nod because you can only raid if you've actually got, as it says, superiority in patrol work, but it's not terribly good on telling you how to establish that. The Canadians bring out um, a marvellous piece on, on recce patrols, but it's, it's actually stuck in their map reading uh, manual. And it's not until December 1917 that you get this document, SS195, which is frankly good enough to use for teaching now. It really is all in there um, and forms a very good structure for understanding what people were supposed to be doing. But it is derivative. It's actually made up of things that people have done and thought through and then brought together. It's not like somebody wrote it and then gave it to people to work from. So they're really making it up as they go along. And you see this very quickly with the experiences of, of the second fifth. When they arrive in, in the line at Beaumont Hamel uh, in February of 1917, and their positions are up on the ridge there. You can see a barn centrally. Uh, this is taken from the German front line. And on both the 15th and the 17th of February, uh, the second fifth pushes patrols down this slope that you can see in front of you. Those patrols, the order for them is patrols will be pushed out, doesn't tell us any more than that. Uh, they are advancing down this forward slope um, in daylight, in khaki uniforms uh, on a background which is largely snow. Uh, and as a result, on both of these days, they take significant casualties and the war diary says, and no information was obtained except for a bit um, by the right hand company. They don't find the machine gun posts that they're looking for, machine gun posts find them. Uh, and this is worsened uh, on the night of the 19th, where uh, after the relief, it becomes clear uh, that they have left a post behind, post 10, which was roughly where that pylon is. Again, this is from the German uh, front line, so not a huge size of no man's land. And because they forget to relieve that post, the men are left there and after two days are raided by the Germans uh, who uh, creep up in a party of 10, get behind it, bomb it out, kill or capture the garrison. So the first experience of, uh, of the Western Front is in the patrolling and, and raiding war. And the second fifth really doesn't do very well. Uh, it takes a large number of, uh, of casualties and the bodies of these men are not covered. Uh, so they have lost you know, a couple of sections uh, and for a unit fresh out from England, these are all people they've trained with for, for several years. So you have to ask yourself, well, what's going on out there? Um, and it's clear that the, the officers and NCOs have had no training in how they are supposed to do these things. Uh, and the orders that they are given, are, I quote, are patrols are to be pushed out. The patrols do not have objectives. Uh, they don't have a clear set of orders. They don't have a really good idea of where the enemy is and what they're looking for. In fact, many of the patrols are sent out to find parts of our, uh, our own brigade rather than the enemy. Movement, direction, concealment are all a problem. I mean, they are uh, operating largely in daylight. Uh, they also, when they do move to night work, have great difficulty in keeping direction. And there is a stand-up fight uh, argument between an officer and his sergeant in no man's land when the officer finds that the uh, uh, patrol has been lined up uh, facing east when it's supposed to be going home. Uh, and the officer says, look, if you go in that direction, you'll all be prisoners within an hour. And they have to settle this by looking at the stars and, and seeing the position of Orion's belt. And then they turn the patrol around and go back in the correct direction. Now, clearly, they didn't have a compass. Uh, there's an officer who loses his revolver and the men crawl around in no man's land until somebody finds it. Uh, and there's also, uh, they're not taking automatic weapons with them. So if they run into trouble, they have to go and get a Lewis gun. It's really not a terribly impressive story. And the brigade intelligence reports of the time, they clearly don't know who's opposite. They don't know what the enemy intentions are. 
uh, and they don't really learn a great deal through this process. So it's really a very poor start. Now, they're not actually heavily involved in patrolling for, uh, for several months after this, until we get to the point where there's the preparation for the first battle of, uh, of Bulacor, when they are holding the, uh, the front line before that attack. And we have a significant change because the second in command of the battalion is now Major Peter of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And he is a professional soldier. In fact, he was a, uh, a squadron sergeant major before he was commissioned. He will go on to be a colonel uh, and a, a battalion commander. Uh, but his background is very interesting. This is a quotation from Tony Ashworth's book, uh, trench warfare, the live and let live system, which I, I do recommend. Uh, and it makes this comment that some units can be relied upon to be very aggressive indeed. And when you look at the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, both of those battalions, you see a very heavy emphasis on uh, developing patrol skills. Uh, there's a photograph of their patrol commanders, all of whom are decorated and military crosses that have entrance uh, uh, qualification for getting into, into that group and a very strong stated belief that you are there to be a fire eater, you're there to be aggressive, your front line, there is no no man's land, your front line is the enemy wire, uh, and people who believe that will be elevated, they will be admired, they will be recognized. This, this is the ethos that he brings to the second fifth. So straight away, you get an enormous difference. So by April, uh, Lieutenant Lucius Smith, uh, that's him top right, uh, of C Company, he goes out on patrol. And this is his patrol report, which is, you can see, is very, very different uh, from the sort of stuff that would have, have been coming back from those early patrols. Um, he goes out uh, on the 8th of April, he goes out again on the 9th of April to check that the artillery uh, is actually now doing its job. Uh, and he fights two small actions during that time, uh, once breaking up a working party with grenades, once using a, a Lewis gun in response to an attack. They're still worried about the uh, quality of the artillery aiming. Uh, so on the next night, lower right, Lieutenant Jeffrey, second lieutenant at the time, Jeffrey Skiro goes out, and he stays in an OP in no man's land under bombardment for the whole of the next day, returning the next night. Uh, so that they are able to, to check that the uh, shelling is falling in precisely the right position. So these are the battalion's first decorations because um, Lucius Smith gets his military cross, um, Jeffrey Smith gets his Croix de Guerre, and one of the sergeants they took with him also got a, a military medal for these patrols. So suddenly a bit more structure uh, is coming into this uh, and they're getting much more definite about their objectives. And this is really where the battalion's experience of patrolling kicks off. In those early months, as you can see, the battalion recorded quite a small number of patrols. But in that around a month, in August and September, there are at least 14 uh, patrols, some of them large fighting patrols. And although they will be raided twice, uh, they will actually defeat both of those raids. So at the end of this period, the uh, officer writing up the, uh, the war diary makes this comment, we're still sending patrols out and consider ourselves the masters of the alleged no man's land. So they're really feeling very confident uh, in their ability at the end of this period. So let's, let's see what they're up to. Um, and we're all about to get a little bit muddy and go crawling through no man's land. Um, these are the photographs that were available for patrol planning. This is an area east of Bukor. Our uh, lines actually run, I hope you can see my mouse, they run north-south. Uh, and these roadways and trench lines to the left are our lines. The German lines are just out of the picture on the right. The things I want to point out to you and make it easier later on are this curve at the bottom, which is a, um, a railway line, and these tracks running through no man's land, particularly this track junction here. So if we take that to the map, you can, once again, our lines are unfortunately in red on this one, uh, running north-south here in squares uh, 29 and five. Uh, and you have the Hindenburg line running north-south over on the right side. And here, just under the six, is the key crossroads uh, 
uh, and machine gun post. So this is the ground that the patrol campaign is, is going to take place uh, on in late August. Um, so on the 27th of, 28th of August, we have a patrol going out, uh, coming out from the sunken road and moving out to a point just south of, uh, of the crossroads. Uh, next night, uh, a further patrol going up into the northern uh, part of no man's land uh, and onto the track through the middle. Uh, next day, a patrol to the track junction. The day after that, a patrol to uh, recce the track in the middle. Once you map all of these, you end up going back to Tony Ashworth because this all looks slightly suspicious. And I'm going to read you just a, a paragraph <coughs> about avoidance, namely avoidance of areas where hostile patrols were most likely to meet. This involved a simple maneuver which, maneuver which diminished chances of encounters. A patrol went forward into no man's land for a few yards only, then turned either left or right, moved parallel with its own trenches and avoided the middle of no man's land. Ian Hay says, at night there exists an informal truce founded on the principle of live and let live. If they did bump into each other, they would ignore each other. And we have German records stating in the last days of August, the 84th Infantry Regiment, who are over there in U, under the U and the C, are putting out patrols every night. But the patrol reports from both sides say that there isn't anything out there. No man's land is quiet. So, sorry, I've missed a patrol. Forgive me, there, was, there were five. Uh, same difference. So it is odd that <clears throat> when on the night between the 31st and the 1st of September, when Lieutenant Hutchinson uh, and some of his friends from C Company, they move out, that's uh, Henry Hutchinson, uh, he's a machine gun officer at the time, and he leaves from a slightly more northern position and he's heading off into, as it says, U30D to take a look at the wire there. Uh, and his target is out here. Now, apart from those two forward machine gun positions, you can see that on this map, there isn't much there. And this is the map that the patrol was planned off. But it all goes terribly wrong. Uh, machine guns open up on them uh, when they are on the track. Uh, Henry Hutchinson is hit in the stomach. His sergeant is killed. One of the corporals is killed. Another man is wounded. And they are blasted to pieces. So suddenly, we're seeing a lot more aggressive response, even though they are still essentially in the middle of no man's land. So what has actually changed? Why is it that Henley gets such a rough handling? The reason for that is actually something that takes place the night before. Because on the night before, a patrol goes out to the crossroads. And then it goes just that little bit further. And this patrol is led by 2nd Lieutenant Commode and 2nd Lieutenant Hutchinson, and they've got 12 men and a Lewis gun with them. They go out to the crossroads, which they have a good look at, and they find some boot marks, and they find some hand grenades. But they then cross over and start moving down into the area which is right in front of the German wire. And at that point, they come under fire from three uh, machine gun positions. Uh, and they make a note of the grids of those, which shows considerable coolness. When the fire has died down, instead of saying, right, we've, we've had a contact, we'll go home, they halt and they observe the enemy around that position. And Commode goes forward, gets to within 30 yards of one of the posts, picks up a field service cap from the 85th Regiment. At that point, he's spotted. Uh, the sentries fire on them, so he throws grenades at them, uh, gets back to the crossroads, and then the patrol withdraws uh, under, uh, as it says, a barrage of rifle grenades and a trench mortar barrage. So he has really stirred things up and very likely uh, has injured some people. So when Hanley Hutchinson, and there, there are the posts, when Hanley Hutchinson goes off to where the black dot is, he gets to about there. And you will notice on this slightly later map, there's a whole set of machine gun positions waiting for him and it all turns very hot indeed. Now, Hanley, of course, um, dies uh, later on the 1st of September, but they have also left two bodies uh, uh, in enemy hands. And over the next couple of days, when it is too light to patrol, they are planning 
and by the 3rd and 4th of September, they are moving patrols out well to the other side of no man's land, uh, ostensibly uh, to harass the enemy, but actually their stated aim is, is to locate uh, the bodies and bring them home, uh, which unfortunately they, they do not manage to do. So by the 6th of September, with various contacts having go gone on, uh, they decide that a further demonstration against the southern side of, of the 84th is necessary. And so they go forward and they go raiding on those posts. So let's go raiding. The place in the line where they come out of uh, is this road. Uh, and actually, as you see bottom right, it's still littered with all sorts of interesting things. Um, so this is a place where you tread carefully. And the patrol is led by 2nd Lieutenant Commode up there on the left. And they move out of this position uh, at about nine o'clock in, in the evening uh, of the 6th. And they make their way up and out into no man's land, uh, passing through a gap in the wire and heading off towards the German positions, which are um, in the fields beyond the tree line that you can see. You can see no man's land rises gently, so he's in dead ground as he comes up. And it takes him about an hour to get to that track junction that's, that's marked. Um, and this is the track junction. And at this point, he discovers that his Lewis gun isn't working. So he sends two of the men, uh, the two Lewis gunners back to get another one. But unfortunately, they're unable to find him in the night. So uh, after a two hour wait, he continues along this track uh, down to this track junction, which is the one that I showed you on the, on the map. And the German uh, posts are in the field to, directly to our front here. Now, at this point, we're able to do something quite unusual because due to the good offices of a, a German family member, we have not only the British patrol reports and raid reports, but we have the German raid reports for this action as well. So while Commode was uh, making his way up to this position, uh, he arrived here at about midnight. Uh, the fourth company uh, of the 84th has actually sent out three patrols. And at 1.30, they are convinced that they hear uh, noise in the area uh, of this crossroads and at a particularly interestingly shaped tree that's just behind it. So, and they are spot on because they are being watched and they're being watched for about the next hour. And at this point, Commode decides to go closer. He's trying to beat his record for how close he can get. Um, and seeing that an NCO visits these posts every 15 minutes, uh, he times his, his approach and gets to within 10 yards of them. And he is right next to these posts at 3.30. At this point, Simpson and the rest of the patrol, who are essentially where we're standing in this photograph, notice that an enemy patrol uh, is coming in from uh, the left, from the northwest. Uh, and he opens fire on it. He says that it's uh, six people uh, uh, approaching. Uh, the actual uh, patrol uh, has three people in it, but he opens fire on them uh, at a distance of about 40 yards. He reckons he hits three of them. Now, the Germans say that it was about 50 yards, uh, and they then find themselves in a very odd situation because as the fire on them starts from Simpson's part of the patrol, their own front line also opens fire on them. So he is now being shot at by his own side and by the enemy. And as the chaos rises, Commode then decides to throw grenades into the posts. Uh, he says he throws four, um, but the German uh, record states, before the rest of the guards could intervene, they were covered by a hail of hand grenades from the north and southeast, no less than six directly hit the short trench, severely wounding the entire crew, except for one man, and damaging the LMG, the light machine gun. Uh, Simpson then opens fire on the posts as well. So now everyone is firing at everyone, um, and the German posts have reported that they are being attacked by a, uh, a patrol of between 50 and 60 men whose muzzle flashes they have uh, counted. Commode makes his way back to the crossroads here, uh, and during that slight lull, uh, the men in the, the German soldiers uh, throw their damaged LMG into a shell hole uh, and start dragging themselves back to uh, their own lines. Simpson and Commode see this, fire on them, uh, and then actually rush into the posts with the bayonet. Um, they find one dead man on the track, 
uh, which is uh, Muska Tish Tishman. Um, uh, but the uh, posts are otherwise unoccupied. They then loot them and withdraw without loss. Uh, the German uh, commander tells a slightly different story because Corporal Grundle counterattacks these posts with rifles and grenades and drives the enemy off. Uh, however, uh, they lose one dead uh, and they lose uh, four seriously wounded uh, men, including the, uh, the machine gunner, who is carried back on a uh, on the back of one of his comrades. So this is quite a nasty little fight. Commode has time with uh, his men to loot the post. And this is the uh, material that they brought back with them. Now it includes two very important things, a light machine gun. That photograph is of an officer of the second fifth inspecting a light machine gun taking two days after this patrol. So. Uh, sorry, the photo is taken two days after the patrol, so I reckon we're looking at the right machine gun. There are important items, the machine gun and of course an identification, which is spot on, they were fighting fourth company, um, and then a bunch of other equipment, rifles, etc, etc. Showing this to a friend with a background in military policing, his question was, that's interesting, where's the rest of it? Because there's a couple of things that are very important, but the rest of it, of this stuff is really not very high value. Uh, and the difficulty uh, is the tendency of soldiers to, as they say at the time, souvenir. Uh, and souveniring is a big problem. Uh, and this is GRO, general routine order. Uh, and I think you can almost hear the frustration in this. Attention is again directed to general routine order number 549. The desire to collect souvenirs has frequently hampered the success of operations, danger of this reprehensible practice. Special articles, letters, attention discs, uh, ID discs, etc. The soldiers are actually just taking them and not handing them in. Now, some of these items can be sold when you get back to the, to the rear areas. Um, but you do have to ask yourself, given that infantrymen have to carry everything they own, really what they're doing with it. And GRO again provides the answer. Postal services, explosives. A considerable number of parcels containing explosives continue to be sent from this country. And it goes on to state that it is really unacceptable to send home shells, grenades, cartridges, fuses or detonators uh, because they do endanger uh, people in the postal service. So clearly uh, for uh, the soldiers uh, of, of the brigade, the thing that will most please mother left at home uh, is a set of hand grenades, or perhaps the girlfriend is getting um, some gas shells because they, they come in such festive colours. Soldiers have always done this sort of thing, uh, and these guys uh, are no different. But seriously, what is actually taking place? They're getting a lot of practice. They are out every night, and the men are, that are out every night are the same men. So we're getting an element of specialization in here. They are now getting to the point where they're causing more casualties uh, and doing more patrols than the enemy. So they are starting to dominate uh, no man's land. And these are not patrols where you, you pop out with a revolver and a, a, a baseball bat and knock some poor fellow on the head. They have got Lewis guns, they have got rifle grenades, they have got the full panoply of, uh, of weapons that a platoon would expect to have. So they can run really a campaign in, in miniature. They're also getting recognition. The medals are coming in uh, and we have this document, which is significant enough that someone framed it and, and gave it to the museum, which is the praise for two raids that take place, a uh, commode small raid on the 6th and a raid by the 2nd 6th on the 11th. The interesting thing is that where normally it is simply the officers that are mentioned, these uh, records show the names of the private soldiers involved. Uh, and that is very rare indeed. So we can actually look into the, the backgrounds of these men uh, and see what sort of chaps they were. But the battalion is clearly transformed in terms of its confidence uh, from what it was uh, a matter of only six or seven months previously. So if at Bulkur, Bulkur, they started to get a taste for aggression, uh, they then rotated out of the line. They were at the Battle of Cambrai. They were in reserve. 
and they don't see much action through until the start of January 1918 when they are up and holding the line uh, near Oppie. Uh, now resources have, have improved, there's a whole bunch of photographs that they have and this is the uh, top of Oppie Wood and these photographs would have been available to patrol commanders to, to help them to plan. So you've got panorama photographs like this one that's north of Oppie Wood, uh, south uh, southern area of, uh, of Oppie Wood uh, with Oppie itself in the background. This is taken from our reserve trenches so you can see our trenches running forward and actually the front line is there running through the middle of the picture. They also have oblique aerial photographs so you can see the churned up no man's land uh, south of Oppie Wood. You can see the track that runs northeast uh, through uh, no man's land south of Oppie Wood, these enclosures in the town itself. They would also take vertical photographs. This again is that trackway. Uh, and down here you can see actually the forward positions of the British front line. That's one of the posts that comes out onto that track, the heavily shelled condition of, of no man's land either side of that track. So when they arrive there, things now fall into uh, a more recognizable pattern. First, they open with the snipers and try and clear as many people out of no man's land as they can. And then they set about a sequence of, of patrols. Now we need to digress for a moment here because these patrols are sponsored by individual companies and each company has a certain personality. So in the second fifth, A company are good, reliable men who do pretty much what they're supposed to do, but uh, nothing exciting comes of, of A company. B company are literate. 80-90% um, of the written material we have that isn't a war diary is written by members of B company. So if something happens, they write about each other, they write to each other. C company are um, frankly semi-literate. Um, most of the stuff that they write needs a lot of deciphering and they don't write much, but they have a very heavy emphasis on fighting and trolling. Uh, and it is likely that the, um, the men who formed the scouts uh, are actually being drawn from C Company. D Company are unlucky. If something bad is gonna happen, it happens to D Company, they get wiped out twice during the war. So when this chap top right arrives, uh, his former Sergeant, now Second Lieutenant Bonkersley, who has a long uh, set of patrol experiences, rather than spreading that experience through the battalion, the CO puts him straight into C Company uh, with the other lunatics uh, where he can go and do his stuff. So when they arrive here in, in January, uh, the first patrol that goes out on the 18th goes to the north of Oppie Wood, uh, sees nothing, finds nothing, um, comes home, uh, and that is A Company's only patrol through this period. <clears throat> Further south, however, on the 19th, out goes a patrol from C Company led by uh, Lieutenant, uh, Second Lieutenant Donkersley. Now, he notices that there's a lot of traffic going up and down this uh, track here between Canteen Post and Oppie because the trenches here are very difficult. And so when they're relieving Canteen Post, the Germans like to travel through no man's land. Uh, and he makes a note of what's going on there and returns quietly to our front line. They rotate out, they rotate back. 25th of January, Donkersley and Simpson go and they sit about 50 yards south of Canteen Post and they just watch movement in and out and time it. They are spotted going back but they take no casualties. A few days later, on the 27th, they decide to probe it. Donkersley, five men, uh, they see working parties around canteen posts, so they organize an artillery barrage and then they fire rifle grenades into it and scoop back to our lines. So having given it a kick, uh, they watch it and they decide that it would be good to raid it. So on the uh, 8th of February, um, Jeffrey Skira, who is now C Company commander, uh, goes out to canteen post. Uh, and they probe the areas all around it, check that it is occupied, and start to plan their raid. But that is, that is the night of a relief. Uh, and traditionally you raid on the night of a relief uh, because that way the retaliation will fall on the incoming battalion. But it's also good to raid the enemy 
uh, when they are being relieved because that gives you the maximum casualty in chaos. So while C Company has been winding everybody up in the center of this map, the raid actually comes in in the south, uh, falls on wood post, uh, and is of course uh, hits D Company, who haven't really bothered anyone during this month. Now any pretense of gentlemanly conduct uh, between patrols has now gone. Um, and I, I'll quote the CO's report. After a sharp fight during which all the garrison of the post was killed or wounded, the raiders were driven off, but succeeded in taking one sergeant and one private with them. Apparently the two men captured offered much resistance, as later one of the captured men was found outside our wire dead. He had been shot, stabbed, and his head battered in. Because of the rotation, um, with the brigade moving out, the 2nd 5th was not able to enact revenge for this, uh, and it clearly rankled with them. But the letters were already flying backwards and forwards. B Company uh, stating, you know, we are the cream of the division. We got our prisoners first, um, uh, even though we were the last up to the line. Uh, C Company, um, in case they're getting above themselves, actually someone surrendered to C Company. Uh, but B Company actually had to fight for theirs. This letter is, is going to a wounded officer at home. So it shows how they're thinking about the competition between companies for the, for the level of aggression. And that prisoner, um, his intelligence, um, uh, his interrogation survives, and he tells an enormous amount about the 471st Infantry Regiment, uh, where it's come from, where he believes it's going to, uh, how it's relieved, how it's armed, how many men it's got, how it's deployed. There's a huge amount of information comes from these uh, interrogations. They are well worthwhile. There's a little bit of a break, uh, much of which is taken up by the March Offensive, where the second fifth fights very successfully at Bukoy, but there isn't a lot of opportunity for patrolling. So it's not until May that they find themselves again holding a sector of the line that is, is suitable for patrols to go out. And this is uh, Bies Wood. <coughs> which is not a particularly uh, churned up in this photograph, although by the time they get there, it really is quite badly churned. Uh, as you can see, uh, open ground, uh, thin lines of, uh, of trees. Uh, if we move on to the map, uh, you get some of the complexity. This is, this is Beers Wood here, and it's the open ground to the southeast of it that we're interested in. Now, this area has been fought over many times. In fact, the second, fifth fought just outside Bukoy, a matter of, uh, of a month earlier. Uh, and it is in this area that the uh, German posts of interest and the raids take place. And it kicks off very aggressively indeed. So on the 20th of May, uh, Donkersley is out uh, and he is trying to get an identification. And he drops into a sentry post occupied by two sentries of 3rd Battalion, 76th Infantry Regiment. Uh, he kills one of them, but the other gets away. Um, and as he pursues them, a large enemy party uh, comes up the other way. Um, and there's a nasty little fight in, in the trench which wounds him. Um, however, he does create casualties and he does get the identification. And for this, he gets his, his military cross. The Germans almost instantly respond um, with a Lieutenant Peterson of the 111th Sturm Troop uh, Company brought in. And he gets through the uh, second fifths outpost line and manages to capture an entire working party of 8th Battalion and its officer, 14 men and an officer, uh, barely firing a shot uh, because the men had gone into their working party uh, without their weapons. Uh, and he herds them up and gets them back um, uh, to his own lines. So it's a very successful raid for him. Instantly, the second fifth responds uh, and responds uh, by bringing commode once again into play. Now, the best thing to do for commode's raid, I think, is, is to read you uh, the passage from someone who was there. This is uh, from a Sergeant Bowman uh, who uh, visited the uh, York Army Museum uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and he goes around the museum and sees the portrait. Uh, so, what does he say? Uh, he sees some machine guns which were captured by 2nd Lieutenant Commode and his party on a daring daylight raid on the German trenches. 
This is the raid that he got the DSO from. Bowman described how 2nd Lieutenant Commode had asked to carry out this raid, selected just a few men to accompany him. He stationed Sergeant Bowman as the observer for the raid. The party tunneled into an old communication trench, crawled up to the German post, hurled in a few grenades, knocking out the sentries, then rushed into the post. The rest of the Germans were in the dugout, but with their arms stacked against the parapet of the trench above. Commode's party threw the German arms away over the trench top. He went down with a pistol, drove them out and came back with 14 prisoners and the machine gun, which we have today in our museum. Bowman says Commode was a remarkable person. Though of slight physique, he was full of energy. He could speak German and often crawled out into no man's land and listened to conversations in the German trenches. So that's just two or three normal days in the office in May 1918 uh, for the patrol commanders of the 2nd 5th. This is the area of ground that, uh, that they were working over though now it's very hard to see uh, precisely where, where the events took place. What we do know is that this was important because here is the silver machine gun that was given by Commode's parents uh, in commemoration of this uh, raid, which is still in the, in the hands of the regiment. Um, and uh, B Company start writing letters again. So uh, a military cross for jolly good work, a DSO, fortnight's leave, uh, and these are uh, Commode's medals in the museum. It also says he got an autographed letter from uh, Sir Julian Byng. Uh, and indeed he did, because here it is. I consider the, the raid to be one of the most successful that's been accomplished. It reflects the greatest credit on Second Lieutenant Commode. So what's going on? Well, we've clearly got an elite group of patrol leaders and members. Uh, they're probably based around C Company. Uh, during the uh, patrol campaign of late September, uh, Jeffrey Skira becomes intelligence officer, so he is responsible for the snipers, the scouts, etc., that formed the core of that patrol platoon. But they were not um, isolated under his command, they actually lived within a company, and that is probably C Company, because when Jeffrey returns to the front after a bout of typhus in November, December, he's no longer intelligence officer. Um, but with some acclaim, uh, he becomes uh, Officer Commanding C Company. So he has the great good fortune to be given that magnificent fighting weapon. The, the um, battalion has clearly now got a culture of aggressive patrolling. They are out there all the time. They have now sequenced uh, each patrol campaign. They begin with sniping and suppressing machine guns with Lewis guns. They then go into a round of careful recce patrols they then plan and conduct these raids. And they are using the latest tactics. Uh, they are using uh, artillery barrages. They're using machine gun barrages, box barrages. Uh, they're in and out within a matter of minutes, sometimes only spending 10 minutes in the trench. They are carrying Stokes mortar uh, bombs because they're better for destroying dugouts. They're carrying phosphorus grenades for setting fire to things. It has become a very sophisticated little operation. So what can we draw from all of this? Let, let's take a little look. Go back to some of those questions. Second fifth arrives quite late. So they're out there for 591 days from arrival to disbandment. But during that time, and this is a generous count, they're only in full scale conventional battles like Bulcourt and Marfo for seven days. Of those nigh on 600 days, they're only actually in the front line for 150 of them due to the various rotations. Now we know from the records that at least 62 patrols go out. More patrols go, there's inconsistencies in the records, uh, but uh, standing patrols, for example, probably didn't count. Wire inspections didn't count. These are real patrols that are expected to come into contact with the enemy. And particularly while Major Peter is in charge, you can expect to be out there uh, pretty much every night that you're not moving into the line or there is not a full moon. So in terms of how often they're patrolling, they're really doing uh, every available night. What does it achieve? Well, I think you see from the, the letters and from the style of, of their records just how aggressive they're becoming. They go from, from people who can actually not get out of their trenches without being spotted to being able to wander across the middle of no man's land in broad daylight 
enter the enemy's trenches, uh, kill, take, burn and destroy, uh, and then get home with, uh, with no casualties. Their, their ability to plan these is clearly now very high, uh, and with that goes morale and self-confidence. When they are raided, and it gets rarer and rarer, they inflict far more casualties on the enemy. Even the um, patrol that got through to capture the 14 unarmed members of 8th Battalion actually took one dead and 11 wounded on the way home uh, when they were machine gunned by the 2nd 5th. So the enemy is having to think twice and they're having to call up specialists before they raid the 62nd Division. <coughs> but also this is a very individual war. It is not often that you are in a position to name the participants on either side. We know that when a raid goes in just north of the 2nd 5th uh, uh, onto the 6th Battalion, uh, that its leader uh, Lieutenant Richard Krag, who was on his first patrol, a man from uh, north eastern Germany, uh, gets into our line and leads his men down almost to, to uh, Company HQ. And there he meets Sergeant Harry Parkin, who steps out and bayonets him. Both of the men die in, the, uh, uh, in this action. So this is a very personal war. And when we start looking at it on a named basis, we know that the second fifth has 73 officers who could be called upon to lead a patrol. And of those, only 24 ever do. And of those 24, only nine of them go out more than once. Now, of the, those nine officers, many are hurt early on, um, but those nine officers will lead over 60% of the patrols. So these guys are doing this a great deal, and they are rare. And they actually also have very little in common. These are those nine officers. And as you can see, we have the son of the Bishop of Knaresborough. Uh, we have uh, an, a Herovian reading law at Cambridge, and we have an apprentice metal worker. They're all the age you would expect of a, of a subaltern. Um, that doesn't tell us anything. Um, they are all Yorkshire born, which means they speak the dialect of their soldiers, uh, which is important. Lucius Smith and Geoffrey Skiro are both uh, outstanding marksmen. Uh, in fact, lower right, you can see Geoffrey with his school shooting trophy. Lucius won um, uh, marksmanship uh, competitions at Marlborough. So when they're leading snipers, uh, they do know what they're talking about. But there's really very little similarity between these men. Um, <clears throat> what they do have in common is that they won't live long. So of those 73%, uh, 73 combat officers, the casualty rate is 24%. But of the patrol officers, it's 62. But they don't die on patrol. Hanley Hutchinson is the only officer who dies on patrol, and he dies on his first patrol. The others tend to die in big battles. Lu uh, Lucius Smith dies of, of wounds sustained in big battle much later on. Um, so you say, well, if, if this patrol war is really as dangerous as we think it to be, why are these guys actually dying in, in big battle? It, it doesn't stack up. In fact, the patrol casualties are, are really very low. And I think we, we have to look at the, uh, the personalities uh, and the experience of the guys who are actually doing this. Now, in general, nowadays, people do not go out in the dark. Uh, and the first time you go out in the dark, Ben's father has a cartoon on this, you cannot believe that people cannot see you. And then as time goes on, you understand how the mind plays tricks, how bored the sentries are, how cold they are, it's raining. And you realize you can get close enough to hear them breathing and nobody will know that you are there. And you, realize, you start to believe that you are in fact invisible. And then as these men do, you get into contact. Now in daylight, people shoot at you, uh, but at night they shoot towards you, where they think you're likely to be. The first time they fire, unless they're very careful, all their night vision is gone, certainly their hearing is gone, um, and they have no real chance of aiming at you. So if you lie still in your shell hole and wait till it all quiets down, you're probably going to be fine which means that you start to believe that because they haven't hit you, they can't hit you. And that becomes a problem when you go back to your job running a platoon in daylight, because at that stage, 
you think that they can't hurt you and you start standing up in full view and you start charging as Jeffrey Skira did charging machine gun posts using only one man and a pistol and at that point you learn that daylight is different and you are not invincible so ladies and gentlemen that's been a very quick raffle through the world of patrolling and uh, so um, on behalf of the men who go for long walks in the dark uh, I would just like to say thank you. Fraser that was absolutely tremendous I thoroughly enjoyed that and I'm sure um, if uh, people have enjoyed that if you'd like to raise your hands as a um, sign of applause and, and I can see that the numbers uh, uh, absolutely going uh, through the roof. So that, that was absolutely um, wonderful um, talk. Um, we'll go through some questions now. Um, so let me just um, have a look at some of these questions. Hello, Peter, you're, you're, you're live. Um, fire away. Yeah, my questions uh, have disappeared, so I'll try and remember. But the one I'm most interested in answering uh, or an answer to is how to differentiate between a patrol a fighting patrol and a, a trench raid yeah um is it is it perhaps uh, an issue of numbers or objectives or, or is it both well or, or, or other factors yeah they nowadays um there would be a very clear difference a recce patrol would be very small it's not designed to get into contact a fighting patrol would be much bigger they lump these all together under minor operations uh, and they use a lot of the words interchangeably. So you, you'll find what is apparently a recce patrol of four men is actually going out looking for trouble. Um, once they get to about 10 uh, patrols of 16 men, they're clearly looking to get very close. I tend to think if they intend to enter the enemy frontline trenches, you're probably looking at a raid. But that's a modern interpretation. They, they wouldn't necessarily say that. A raid could be at, at battalion strength. Yeah. Commodes, what I would say was a fighting patrol, is described as a raid, even though there's only uh, seven blokes involved. So the, these are definitions that, that are more um, modern than they would have recognized. I see. <clears throat> um, it's the same when they've got um, sniping units out. They're all just minor operations. They're things you're doing that's not a big battle. Thank you. Thanks. Um, P uh, P Peter, you also asked um, uh, about um, Commode's death in 1918. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know at the time I asked it whether you'd actually covered that. You you sort of covered all of them in a, in a sense, but I'm particularly interested in Commode. Um, what, what were the circumstances of his death in July? Okay. He was um, killed in an artillery barrage while acting as brigade intelligence officer. Uh, uh, so it was just Dumb one luck. of those things. Yeah. Um, nobody, and we have the list of who gets wounded. Nobody ever marks commode. Nobody even gets near him. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Right. Let me just. Um... Malcolm Curl. Malcolm, you're live. Do you want to... Um... Okay, thank you very much. Um, Fraser, you, your, your um, comments about uh, souvenir hunting and posting things back to loved ones, <clears throat> were there any recorded instances of mailed ordnance exploding whilst in the postal system? Only what we have in, GR, in general routine orders. Um, and they, they have to make the point several times that you are just not to do this. Um, and my feeling is, you know, were it not happening, they wouldn't have put it into uh, into GRO. But, well, but this is this is very very common. My um, military police friend was in charge of searching the armored fighting vehicles coming back from Bosnia, uh, and um, uh, discovered uh, a Soviet 120 millimeter mortar that was being smuggled back to Atkinson <laughs> in pieces. <laughs> I leave it to your imagination what three men from Africa require a mortar from. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Th thanks for that. John, um, I can hear you. We can't see you, but that's okay. Find a way, John. Chris, I was only going to ask, you were mentioning one or two of the officers had particular marksmanship skills. Um, in, in my World War II research, 
I've come across examples of uh, reconnaissance platoons who were staffed by people who were gamekeepers, you know, folks who had countryside experience. Is there any evidence that the enlisted men who assisted with these patrols uh, were, you know, of that type? On, on the names we've got, there is not. Um, but then there's no evidence that the, the guys who were actually doing the raids were the snipers. The snipers would be part of the scouts. In a raid, they were often used off on the flank for security, so we might not actually see them entering the trenches. It is extremely difficult to get the names of snipers. Uh, it's, it's not something that people wrote about or, or admitted to a, a great deal. The uh, battalion and, and brigade records on sniping are actually very interesting because the intelligence reports essentially have it almost shot by shot. So you can see uh, where the snipers are positioned, you can see what uh, sorts of ranges they're firing at, uh, and you can see the hits and kills that they are claiming for, for each period. So during the period of, um, uh, particularly up at, at Bulkur, uh, at the start of that, if you want a sniper's rifle, if you want a rifle with a telescopic sight, that's actually kept at brigade and you've got to apply to have it. Uh, within a matter of, of weeks, these things are uh, actually moving around with the men in question uh, and they're regarded as a standard part of the kit and the sniper's posts belong to individuals. So the, whether the guys had a lot of skill at sniping when they started, I don't know. The first school that was run for them when they arrived in France was sniping school. Uh, and they are getting to the point where they're in static warfare. They're getting off four or five shots a day and claiming uh, probably two kills a day. So, now, thanks for that. Right. The, Ger the German casualty records don't always match. So sometimes you get kills claimed and actually no member of, of the company in the front line has been killed but they've clearly seen someone fall, or at least uh, develop a sudden desire to be elsewhere. Super, Th thanks for that, um, Fraser. Let me just, um, Mark Armstrong, I'm just, going, I'm just asking you to unmute. Do you wanna just try again with your question? No, we can't hear you. M Mark, Mark, doesn't matter. Mark, I'm gonna ask you a question for you. Uh, Mark asked, uh, to what extent were their MC, Mons Cross Hunters, amongst the officer corps, those who um, saw leading patrols as a means towards an MC and promotion? It, this is a very interesting one because, uh, and back to, to Tony Ashworth, um, people were very suspicious uh, of aggressive officers because aggressive officers tend to get you killed. Uh, and there were all sorts of ways of suppressing um, uh, aggressive behavior uh, by officers. Um, most of these guys, uh, I don't think we're, we're, we're seeing that. They are what would be referred to as thrusters and fire eaters, but they're being clustered together in places with like-minded individuals. Uh, I don't think there's... Um, evidence that this was glory hunting i suspect much more that it comes from you've got a bunch of 21 year old men who are highly competitive and who are becoming professional soldiers now every frontline soldier looks down on everyone who is not a frontline soldier um, and amongst the front line clearly the officers who go out into no man's land of their own volition look down on everybody else so i think you're seeing a level of competition between companies and between young men uh, rather than a, a desire for personal glory. Right. Thanks very much for that. Mark, sorry I can't, you can't ask your question live but I think I, that covered that. Uh, Don, Don Healy, um, Don you're live, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, great talk. So to ask what firearms did they carry with them when they went on patrol? Like in the Enfield I used to carry one when it was in the FCA in Ireland back in the 70s, it's an awkward joke to carry around with you at night time. Would you use sidearms or what do you think? Well, I think there's, there's two things here. One is what is the evidence we've got? Uh, and the evidence is that they're carrying Lee Enfields, 
uh, and bayonets, often with, with bayonets fixed, um, so it's even more awkward to carry. Uh, they're clearly using Mills bombs, they're clearly using rifle grenades, um, and they've got their Lewis guns with them. Um, they are also using, uh, to an extent, improvised munitions, the, the Stokes, uh, modified Stokes mortar uh, shell for destroying bunkers. Now you see in the museums that people are carrying trench clubs and, and knives and revolvers. So the second part is there's actually no written evidence for uh, them using those sorts of things on these patrols. But knowing the people who do this kind of work, I would be astounded if they were not festooned with things that they were not supposed to have. Um, clubs, knives, knuckle dusters, um, preferably um, items of enemy origin because those have a certain amount of status, uh, but can't prove any of it. Um, in Kermode's will, he leaves his special patrol equipment to four uh, of his um, uh, private soldiers, who I assume were members of his uh, uh, reconnaissance buddies. I, again, leave it to your imagination what that equipment could possibly have consisted of. Right. Th th thanks for that, Fraser. So sorry, I'm just uh, try trying to deal with the numerous You're questions. You're in a fantastic job, David. <laughs> uh, Dick Richards, um, so you. You're live. Um, Nick, do you want to ask um, your question? Uh, yes, thank you, David. And uh, Fraser, thank you for uh, uh, a, really good, uh, a really good talk. I'm interested in the skills and the talents of those people who were selected um, for, uh, for the raids. Were they selected based on the objectives of the raids or were they volunteers? And uh, what particular skills and talents were, were valued uh, um, amongst the men, what were the, what were the, the significant uh, skills that were required? The, the core of small scale patrolling and raiding is based around the scouts. Uh, so you've got 16 uh, men at least in the battalion uh, whose job it is to do these sorts of things. These are specialists, they are excused fatigues, they're excused sentry duty, uh, they have access to different kit they have access to additional rum. Uh, on a big raid, uh, their job tends to be more guides. So they are the people who will do the reconnaissance. They will lead fighting uh, units into position. So a, a raid will have cover groups. It will have um, uh, reserves that you fall back through. It will have carrying parties. The scouts will organize uh, and lead those and get everybody in the right place at the right time uh, so that they're actually attacking in the right place. Once you get beyond 20 men, you're actually dealing with ordinary men of the company. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will be down to platoon officers to select those. Now, the evidence is they're using, um, uh, basically, they will use a number of platoons because those men are used to working together. They've got all of the necessary specialties for doing this, bombers, riflemen, uh, Lewis gunners, etc. So they're just deploying platoons. Interestingly, in a number of cases where a man has been snatched or murdered, the company that goes out on the next raid is the company from which that man was taken. Uh, mm -hmm. And Bruce Bairn's father actually has some uh, uh, cartoons uh, uh, um, where you know clearly revenge is a, a perfectly acceptable motive for doing this stuff so uh that that big uh list of men from the second six that you saw on the order of the day that's all c company of the second six and a month beforehand uh the germans got into the front line and abducted uh private lister of c company of the second six so they're the guys that go after them thank you please. thank you super thanks um Right, um, Michael Dale, um, just unmuting you there, or if you can just unmute yourself, Michael. Yep, you're live. Do you want to um, go ahead with your question, Michael? Right, right. thanks uh, very much, Fraser. It was really interesting. I've been doing um, my family history, and I know one of my relatives is uh, an officer in a different regiment, and I know he led a couple of the raids. Where do you find these reports that the, the Patrol reports that you keep referring to. Right. They are, 
you'll normally get a reference in the war diary to the fact a patrol went out, but you won't get any detail. You need to be one level higher in the brigade war diaries. Now, in the annexes to the brigade war diaries, you will find the daily intelligence summary, and it runs from midday on one day to midday on the next. And they do one every day uh, that they are actually in the line. And those are divided up into our activity, enemy activity, uh, sniping, <coughs> and uh, patrolling of all form. And they will tend to name the officer uh, that led the patrol. Uh, although sometimes they will disguise the battalion, but you'll know that anyway. Uh, and you will have the patrol report and a complete description, uh, and you'll have the grid references where it took place. If they've managed to lift a, a prisoner, you need to go up a level to the divisional intelligence summaries, where you will often find the interrogation record for the prisoner um, about four or five days later. Uh, but it should all be there for you. Great, thanks. Sounds like I've got some work to do. Yep. Um, <laughs> if, if they lose a man, if they lose a prisoner, uh, go to the Red Cross records, um, because that the uh, Germans will then tell you where they captured the man. Uh, and and you, that is often helpful in, in looking at how the patrol went. Great, thanks very much. Brilliant. Have fun, it's, it's a lovely way to spend your time. <laughs> Good question, Michael, thanks for that. Right, um, just a couple of more questions, I think, before we, we, we possibly call it a day. Um, I won't put the, these up to, to the screen because I think uh, one person's um, gone and um, another question was, uh, um, it, well, this is the other question. M Michael asks, are there any recorded instances of mailed ordnance exploding whilst in the postal system? It's a good question, that, because I, I was particularly bemused by, by your description of the general routine orders that, uh, that covered that point. I, mean, I think it's um, routine orders exist for a reason. And if it wasn't all going off, they wouldn't be um, threatening to take away your leave um, uh, if, if you were doing it. So... Uh, I don't know. I think uh, we would have to look in the uh, the records of the post office uh, <laughs> to find out how many folk they lost. Um, but it is completely unsurprising to me that they were doing it. It sounds absolutely balmy, but, but um, I suppose it's just human nature, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It just comes under the heading of it seemed like a good idea at the time. It, it has always been believed in the infantry that if it is not properly nailed down, it belongs to you. <laughs> it's fair game, yeah. Um, and um, this might well be, end up being, being the final question unless uh, there's a flood of further further questions. Don Healy asked, uh, no he didn't, where are we? Jack Wallen asked, how does German raid doctrine compare? Ah, uh, it's really quite different um, as, as far as we can tell. So. <coughs> Um, the German raids are less frequent, um, uh, and often, uh, if it's a small enterprise, you you might get um, the unit that's holding the line opposite. So, you know, on the night of Commode's raid, uh, four company of the 84th has got three patrols out, but they're not designed to to go and do anything particularly spectacular. Uh, when the second six is raided, um, and when uh, those gentlemen are lifted from, from 8th Battalion. Uh, the German records quite clearly state that they have called upon the stormtrooper units that are attached to their divisions to come in and do the work. So, for example, the raid that takes place on the 2nd 6th, we've always thought a raid. Now we've got the German records we understand that in fact the Germans thought that we were tunneling out of that position in the apex and they sent in uh, a stormtrooper unit, a number of members of, of the 84th to act as guides and a unit of pioneers to blow up the mine shafts that weren't there. So they are um, they're doing things less frequently on a bigger scale. They've been rehearsing that raid for two weeks Whereas, say, one of Commode's raids, um, the planning has probably been done two nights before. Uh, the battalions don't require much in the way of um, uh, senior authorization to go and do this stuff, uh, whereas the Germans are thinking it through really very carefully. It's got, we're here for an identification, 
we are here to destroy a particular thing, a machine gun post, a mine shaft. Um, we're going to do that and we're going to get out. Some of their raids are in the front line trench for six minutes. You have almost no time to respond. Mm. That's, uh, that's, uh, like I said, no, no time to respond on that one. Um, th thanks, Fraser. Right. Um, probably the last question, which nice, might well nicely dovetail into a little bit of a, a commercial for you, or, or, or if you're going to hide, hide uh, <laughs> being be modest, the, the commercial you did earlier for, for somebody else's book. Yep. Uh, Nick, Nick Yellow actually asked, can you reshow the book and author again, please? Um, because uh, we were a bit too quick for him just before okay. we started. So Nick, um, and for everybody else, this is, go on, Fraser, tell us about the book. We, we were joking earlier that um, authors use this as a, a forum for promoting their own books, so I thought I'd promote somebody else. I mean, if you would like to read my book, I'd be very, very grateful. But, but hang on, right. tell, tell people what the book is, Fraser. My book is um, uh, called Massacre on the Marne. It's published by Pen and Sword back in 2005. And it's, it is a battalion history. It's the stories, some of which you've heard over the, over the last couple of um, uh, talks that I've given. Um, uh, and it is really how that battalion changed from being uh, really a very poor performing one uh, to being a battalion that was uh, capable of uh, really superb offensive actions like Combray and defensive actions like uh, Combray. So uh, available on Amazon um, and, and I hope you enjoy it. And thoroughly recommend it, yes. Uh, the one I'm actually plugging uh, it now, uh, let's see if I can get this on camera. Is that there? Yeah, it, it is, although it's probably a little bit small text-wise. So, okay. so, so it's called On the Dangerous Edge, uh, and it is uh, the writer is uh, Kenneth Radley. And for those of you who, who weren't here when we were chatting about it, uh, it is a, a very comprehensive document about the development of British and Canadian trench raiding on the Western Front. Um, uh, it is it is dense. Uh, the maps are are, are very good, um, and it really does get into the detail of how these things are are planned and, and conducted. Uh, and there's simply no point in writing a book on patrolling because it's been written. This is really very good. Uh, as I said, the, the bibliography is forty pages. Um, the man is an ex soldier and an academic. Uh, it's it's not an easy read. Um, but it really is well worthwhile if you're into this stuff. Well, th thanks very much indeed for, for that. And uh, just the, the final observation, I think, is just the last last thing that's just come in now, which might, might bemuse you uh, from Mark, Mark Armstrong, who, who uh, we had difficulty with the sound with earlier. But Mark said, uh, not a question, but a comment, but you can disguise an Iraqi 80 millimeter mortar barrel as the exhaust to a generator as a means of getting one past their own uh, military police. Uh, obviously, uh, speaking from absolutely no, 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 no sense of experience whatsoever, which is not the case because I know Mark was in Iraq. So it's, it's <laughs> quite clearly that there is, um, even, even today, that there are ways and means of uh, getting stuff home again. Uh, this is this is certainly true. I can say that the um, communications mast boxes uh, um, actually take uh, are four bottles of Bushmills square, um, so you can get four bottles of Bushmills by nine foot high on the side of every vehicle as it comes back from Germany, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly, uh, so so you've heard on the grapevine. Um, Fraser, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I'm sure that everybody else did. As a final round of applause, if anybody who is uh, uh, enjoyed that, which is to, to just to kind of raise the hands and once again uh, the, it's going through the roof. Everybody's thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and I, I will say on that note, Fraser, uh, this was one, your second. Oh. One, one quick one. Um, I'm very, if, if there's more complex stuff or you're interested or the stuff you didn't get to ask, um, if you email through to, to David, he will send it through to me. I'm oh, delighted well. to, to continue the conversation. Absolutely, yes. So more complex questions are if I've missed anybody off, which is quite possible because it's a bit tricky to, to, to keep an eye on, on all the questions that come in. 
Um, but yes, just pop the questions through and I'll certainly forward them to Fraser. But uh, a final thing, thanks ever so much. It's your second uh, webinar for the Western Front Association. Um, if anybody's watching this who isn't a member of the WFA, please do join us. Subscriptions are very modest and you get an awful lot of bang for your buck. Um, so please do join the WFA and Fraser, finally, once again, sincere thanks uh, for your superb presentation this evening. Thanks very much indeed. My pleasure. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks and good night.